Joining me today on the Neil Wilkins podcast is Carla Salvaranga, who is the author of The Rules of Persuasion. Now, this is a brand new book that we are going to be fascinated by if we are a marketer, if we're in business, if we are representing a brand, or if we're just a human being looking to become more adept in the art of persuasion. And apparently there are some rules to this technique or to this way of living. So welcome to the episode, Carlos. Neil, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me on and thank you for all your listeners for tuning in. So persuasion, of all the things that you could have chosen in communication, in living, in life, in everything, you've chosen persuasion. Why? I tell you the origin of this book, which I, I hadn't planned to write. I, I was uh, I started my career as a journalist and became a consultant, one of the best partner at Accenture and EY, left consulting, worked for with a very elite senior executive group called World 50, and then left that because I wanted to write and, and to research. Uh, and so uh, my my first book that I set out to write was a novel. And so uh, writing can be kind of a lonely thing. So I, I decided to volunteer with nonprofits. And there's a website in the US that will connect you with nonprofits. And the very first project I was connected to was a gentleman, a very senior gentleman, chairman and CEO of an amazing international relief organization. And this project was something like help I'm a terrible speaker. Uh, I can't read a script. I don't feel like I'm connecting with the audience. And I, I, somebody, please help me. So I talked to him and I said uh, two things. I said, first of all, I've seen lots of very, very famous speakers up close and personal, heads of state from when I was at 150. And they tend to come in two flavors. There are the classical musicians who can read a script sort of word by word, like a prompter, right? And it's always the same and it's perfect. And then the, the jazz musicians where you kind of give them a theme and they improvise. It's always the same message, but never the same speech uh, or presentation. I said, you're definitely a jazz musician. So maybe put the Bach down for a while and let's think about how do you play jazz. But the other thing is I've heard your I've seen your videos, heard your speeches, read them. And I, I'm not persuaded. Like, I'm not sure what you're trying to get me to believe. And I think we should talk about that and work on that. So he see, he agreed, and I ordered some books from Amazon that were about persuasion, supposedly. But when I read them or opened them, they weren't about persuasion. They were about influence, manipulation, psychology, negotiation, a lot of different things. And I wanted just that word, and I couldn't find a book on it. So I had to go back to a book from college called The Rhetoric by the philosopher Aristotle, which is in some parts of it about this. And I turned it into a PowerPoint deck. I said, let's go through this deck take us a couple months, but I think if we do it right, you'll see what I mean uh, and what's missing. So he did and we did, and it was a huge success. In fact, he invited me for a second project, fast, which was also successful. Fast forward a year had gone by and I'd done a dozen of these projects with CEOs and founders. And my wife said, you really need to write this down. <laughs> uh, but I was writing, which I was writing another book and, and she said, no, 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 just put it on, make, make an outline and send it to an agent. And the agent said, if you write it, I'll sell it. And so three years went by writing, researching, publishing, because it's a slow business. And the book came out last fall, and it's called The Rules of Persuasion. Mm -hmm. So persuasion is not negotiation. It's not presenting. It's not influencing. It's persuasion. Can right. you clarify that? Because to me, it would be all of the above yeah. and probably a little bit more. So is it different and how and why? It is. It, it explains people because they'll ask me, what is the relationship between your book and like Cialdini's book on influence, for example? And what I say is this. Um, we had medicine long before we had chemistry. Right. We knew this plant cures a rash. We don't know why, but we just know that it does. My book isn't medicine. That's medicine. My book is the chemistry. It's why a good book on selling is a good book on selling. It's why a good book on, on negotiation is a good book on negotiation. And what I and what I say in the in the my book is, erase the idea that persuasion is a soft skill or some amorphous trait or something you're just born with. It is chemistry with language. It has rules. It's mostly predictable. Um, and what I say in in the book as well is this: that it's I build an Aristotle's definition because he has two things that he contributes. Right, they're foundational. First, he says. What is persuasion? And when I coach people, I say, finish this sentence. Persuasion is dot, dot, dot. And at almost 40 projects, no one can answer that question with confidence. 
And I say, well, look, the reason I ask the question is that it's hard to be good at something that we can't define, right? So let's start with the definition. And his definition is persuasion is a demonstration that something is true or appears to be true, full stop. Very simple, but very uh, powerful and it has many implications. The most important one being that I don't persuade you truth or the appearance of truth persuades. So my job isn't to change your mind. My job is to get you to believe something. If I can get you to believe something, then unless you're irrational, he says, you will be persuaded. Then in his book, he says, by the way, only three things persuade, which is the character of the communicator, be it a person, a brand, uh, a government, right? Uh, anything, a work of art, the arguments presented, things like logic and proofs, and then the feeling aroused in the audience. Now, the weird thing about Aristotle is this, is that sometimes the more obvious something is, the less he explains it. <laughs> and so he, you've heard these three terms, ethos, pathos, logos, probably a, a million times, but you probably didn't have them explained in great detail because he doesn't explain them, problem one. And problem two is that the, the rhetoric was not a book to be read. It was, as best as we can tell, teaching notes. It was a private notebook. So it's not organized like a front to back sort of read. It's not a treatise, it's just thoughts. And he says this, but doesn't really explain. He goes into other things. So my, my book was really an attempt to answer two questions. Well, what do you mean by this, Aristotle? What do you mean by character? What do you mean by argument or emotion? And then what exactly is persuasion? When I'm persuaded, what really is going on? So that the whole book was an attempt to, to deal with these two questions. And, and so, um, what I say in the book, and I'll make, just present the main thesis, is that if we take the character part, we can divide it into seven elements, seven parts, things like origin, language, style, etc. If we take the argument part, we can divide that into seven parts, logic, proofs, laws and standards, antecedents. If we take the emotion, we have seven kinds of emotions, positive, negative, exhortative, contemplative, mystical, religious, so now you've got these 21 things. And I was sitting in my desk with these 21 pieces and I kept thinking, how can I, how can I put these together in some metaphor that explains it? And then I thought, it's just high school chemistry class. <laughs> it's a periodic table. And so <laughs> what communicators do is they blend these elements, usually a few, into messages and the good messages create energy. So I say in the book, persuasion is made from these elements and uh, and the best way to think about it is chemistry with language mm, gosh there's so many metaphors uh, analogies that you're presenting me with here it's just where the next question could come from there's there's a hundred questions i've got um this is really interesting stuff carlos because the one word i guess that for me really resonated and really came through there was the word truth because I guess one of my concerns with this word persuasion in the old definition that I had before having met you, um, which is, I've now completely it's thrown everything on its head, which is wonderful. But prior to that, I would have thought that there's a danger with the word persuasion or at least a risk, not necessarily a danger, but a risk that it could be misused. But the fact you've used the word truth there in that definition means that it's for the highest and best good of everything and everyone is is, I, is that kind of is that a correct sort of assumption in this new I definition really, but here's where it gets tricky right because chemistry is a moral i can use chemistry to save your life i can use chemistry to take your life and so like real chemistry quote unquote right the chemistry of language can be used for good it can be used for evil in fact there's a chapter in the book chapter nine which is all about the the corruption of persuasion, right? And so, uh, and by the way, this is why we're not taught this anymore. Right? We used to be, it was impossible to be an educated person in, in the in the West up until World War II without having studied the things I write about. But after World War II, it came out of the curriculum slowly over a period of a few decades. And so it, it is now a topic for scholars and, and rhetoricians, but it isn't a mainstream topic. And in fact, when I talk about this and I, and I it has to do talks in the book. I often start with a slide, which is a, a fuzzy picture of a man playing the piano on a stage. And I and I say, especially to lawyers, <laughs> I talk to lawyers, I said, imagine you're trying to make partner in the firm. 
or become CEO or, or president of, of whatever. And you have to go through all these job interviews and all these boards and everything goes great. You've aced everything. After all these months, they say, look, the job is yours, Neil. There's only one thing left. Meet us at Tuesday at 10 o'clock at this room and you show up and there's just a stage with a piano and the whole company sitting in the audience. And they go, the last thing, Neil, is just go up there and play anything you like. Bach, Brahms, a little Mozart, doesn't make a difference to us. Just, you know, a little light something. And you go, wait a minute, <laughs> I have never taken piano lessons. And they go, well, that's odd because all our leaders are really good at piano. So you just, you, you just got to give it a shot. Now, it's not like a silly story, but if I replace piano with persuade, what's the difference? Suddenly, it's the exact same setting. And this is the issue, that in all these jobs, you're supposed to be good at something no one ever taught you to do. No one even explained it to you. You didn't even know there were rules, <laughs> right? And so, so, hence the book, which is, look, here is a manual, the chemistry book, right? for how this works. And when I coach people and work with them, it's really funny sometimes where we talk about something and I go, change this, alter the chemistry a little bit this way, add a little bit of that, and then suddenly everything changes. And they're just done. And I go, it's it's not me. I just happen to know the chemistry and I'm sharing it with you. If you learn it, you can do the same thing. That's the interesting part. And so when I, uh, I joke with people, I say, I've studied thousands of messages for this book. And in the book, there are hundreds and hundreds of examples, 40 QR codes to videos. I like to use film a lot, especially. And I say, every message, human to human, human to God, God to God, and God to human that I've ever looked at is some combination of these 21 things. Mm, this is so fundamental, isn't it? Is it? It's incredible that we haven't been taught this. Well, why do you think that is? Is it is it the you know certain? I mean, I don't want to go down conspiracy theory route here, but is it is it kind of that this is this almost ultimate secret that we haven't been taught this because we, as in the masses, are not meant to know this stuff because well, I tell you, become I quite powerful if you're persuasive. I have a very distinguished scholar friend who didn't want me to write the book, and half jokingly was for what you just said. He said, look, it's, it was taken out of the curriculum because look at what it did in Nazi Germany, right? It fell into the wrong hands. And in my chapter, uh, that's the case study I use. And my guide is a, a, a man named Victor Klemperer who wrote a book that was published in 1947 called The Language of the Third Reich, where he was a linguist and he examines the language of the regime. And so I take in that chapter, I pick nine examples of corrupt chemistry of persuasion and I label them. And I say, I could have picked a dozen others. I picked these nine because all nine are present in American social and political discourse today, which is evidence to me that someone's trying to poison us with language, right? And so I think, I think you're exactly right. And I understand why it was taken out of the curriculum, but the problem is if I don't teach chemistry, that doesn't mean that chemistry stops working. I mean, it still exists, right? So hence the debate. Is it better to keep this a secret, a subject for specialists, right, in academia? Or, and even when I had the book, I had two, my short list of publishers came down to two publishers. One was a very distinguished, actually UK academic press, uh, where it would have gone to an academic audience, specialist primarily, or an American press who wanted to treat the book as a popular book paperback, audio version, Kindle, so that any, almost anyone could read it. And I went back and forth. Where do I put it? And at the end of the day, I put it in the popular press and, and because I wanted to make it something that anybody could get, not just professors, right? So I say it's a, the book has scholarship, but it's not a scholarly book. It's meant to be read by anyone who wants to understand what this is. Mm -hmm. Mm, so does it have then, just by definition, and I think that was, I think, a masterful stroke personally, and it's just my humble opinion here, that you went that route rather than the academic route, because to me what that's opened up is this opportunity for the, the reader, for example, so say, it's me, I have the book, I'm reading the book, I can learn how to, not say master, but journey in the art and the science of persuasion right. with the new lang language of chemistry, but I can also then use my knowledge, having read the book, 
to maybe pick apart, maybe challenge narratives that I see from maybe close others, maybe mass media, and I can actually then critique things, again, going back to this word truth, in a more, I guess, rigorous way and really open up to the fact that what I'm being told isn't necessarily the truth. Because now when I'm using my newfound chemistry set, I can understand whether this is correct, whether this isn't correct, whether this is questionable. Is this is this almost like a, a truth drug, as it were? Yeah, and I and I joke with people that I thought of my book, or I think of it as as a vaccine, it's inoculation, staying with the chemistry metaphor, right? Of, uh, and in fact, when I've coached people, I um, one thing we do from the beginning is say you must keep a persuasion journal the whole time we work together, and I want you to make a note of a commercial, a moment at your work, anything that strikes you as particularly good or particularly bad. In the beginning, you will not see the chemistry. By the time we're done working, you will. And in fact, I've show, I, I can show when I do talks, I show, I show the formula, I show the percentage, and I say, you're about to see a clip, right? This clip has these elements of, of character, these two elements of emotion. Look for them, watch the chemistry, and then they watch the clip, and then suddenly, I see exactly what you were talking about. And, and even to the point where I want you to get to the, where I say, okay, I'm going to give you a, a chemistry, and I want you to invent a story. Say, say, make up a, a, a persuasive formulation that uses these elements, right? And and changing them. And what happens, what's interesting is when I've coached everybody, and I've coached maybe f almost 40 people, right? All, all of them just very, very successful people, prof business school professors, CEOs, founders, you, you know, uh, tech entrepreneurs. And the funny thing about it is that because they're in those roles, I, I find almost always the same situation, which is they don't use character, either because they were told by somebody you shouldn't be part of the story, which is a huge mistake. They don't use emotion, either because they can't or they tried and failed, which means all they have left is argument, right? And I say, it's like a ship with three masts, but only one sail is open. <laughs> and the one sail is kind of tattered because it's been through all the storms. So why don't we just lower that sail a bit? Let's open character, let's open feeling and watch the ship move. You'll go faster and farther, right? Than you ever have, because now you're using everything. As I also would say, all the available means, right? And, and that's really what it is. And it's a funny thing because people think, okay, it's 21 elements. Does I mean have to learn 21 elements? And I go, no, you don't, because just like in real chemistry, I don't know of anything that's made from all the elements, right? And in fact, in university, we have a whole course on one element, carbon. Right? It's called organic chemistry, and so. That's how important that is. And there's almost parallels to that in this. Origin to me is the carbon of persuasion. Um, it is probably the most powerful thing you can work with. And so um, it's just about learning how the what these elements are, finding the one or two that work for you. Same thing with feeling, right? I ask people sometimes who are struggling, tell me what you want me to feel when you stop talking. And they don't answer. And I said, well, I'm going to feel something. So if you don't know what it is, then it's happening by accident. So why don't you engineer what I, what you want me to feel? And they go, well, how do I do that? And I go, okay, well, let's let's figure it out. What, what emotion do you want? And then let's create it. Suddenly, everything begins to change once you start thinking this way. So yeah, I, I think, you know, uh, I'm a musician. Great, you know, musicians listen to a lot of music. Writers read a lot. I think good communicators study communication. Good persuaders mm. study persuasion. There's a real soundbite there, isn't it? It's like, if you want to do this stuff, you have to almost become the scholar of the topic. You can't just switch a switch a, um, a switch, or you can't just watch a quick YouTube video and think, right now I can persuade. It, th this feels like it's a little bit of a journey that involves a little bit of self-reflection to figure out out of this chemistry set, which of these you know, elements that I'm actually going to be most, I guess, aligned with or which ones I'm going to prefer because they're more kind of aligned with me. It is self-reflection and kind of self-listening a key it's, part it's of this. Thing because it's because especially because of audiences, and I have a, a section in the book about audiences, and there are four in my model types of audiences. One is us, 
we're often persuading ourselves of things, right? So what I call the deliberative audience. There's the dialectic audience, which is you and I. And that's not debate. Dialectic is you and I trying to find an answer or a solution. Uh, the platonic dialogues, Socratic dialogues are dialectic often in many cases. There is what's called the defined audience, all employees of a company, all customers of a brand, right? All citizens of the UK. And then there's what's called the universal audience, which anyone who could ever receive your message now or in the future. For most people, they don't worry about those things. <laughs> the last one, they they either, and most people don't even worry about the fine because most people are not professional speakers. It's dialectic, right? That that you're really dealing with most, with one person. It's your boss, it's your employee, it's a colleague. And sometimes it's defined. If you're a leader, you now have a defined audience, which is your the people you lead. So this is the key thing. It's reflecting on that and how, do, how does that work? And I'll give you a real, one of my favorite examples is a tr true story. Uh, I, I coached a woman who was a very accomplished physician. She'd done very well in medicine. When she, she retired early from medicine and started a, a foundation to do uh, coral reef preservation. And I and she reached out to me on, on this platform. She said, I'm really struggling. We've done well. So I'm being us to interviews. I'm on the radio. I am in, in, in print and TV. And it's not going well. I'm not connecting, right? I'm, the feedback I'm getting that I'm coming across, not in a positive way. So I asked her, after we went through the, the framework, I said, um, why'd you start this foundation? And she had all these great logical reasons. Well, I had retired early. I'd done well. My kids, I'm an empty nester. I, re, I looked at the statistics, the data about environmental change, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very nice three minute logical explanation that didn't impact me at all. It's like, I get it. It's great. I could have read that in nature, but that's not why you did this. That's why anybody did this. I want to know why you did this. That's why anybody, you just tell me why someone would start a foundation. You didn't tell me why you started to. I said, go back to what we talked about character and, and think about the element called origin, which is where does something begin? What is the source of character? Just be, pause for a second and then answer the question again, but tell me about you. And so she just sat and, and after two minutes, she said, when I was a little girl growing up in Puerto Rico, I think it was about six or seven, I saw a TV show called Jack Cousteau. And this is a French guy who was a diver. And he used to go around the world and he was a marine biologist and he talked about the sea and about how precious it was. And I grew up wanting to be Jack Cousteau. That's all I ever wanted. And unfortunately, my family had other plans for me. I went to medical school, I became a doctor, but the moment I could leave medicine, <laughs> I left medicine. I was fortunate. I had the ability to, to, to do what I wanted to do. I moved to Hawaii, I learned how to dive, and I went diving because I wanted to be a fish photographer. That was my what I thought I would do. But I'm the world's worst fish photographer. All my photos were just tails. <laughs> so she said I would go to the same place, this coral reef area, but I end up there were either blurry or the tails. And I was getting pretty frustrated. And one day I went out and there were no fish. And I looked up and I noticed for the first time the coral, the reef. And then I realized I haven't been coming here for the fish. I've been coming here for the reef. And in that instant, I decided that I'd spend the rest of my life protecting what I was looking at because it couldn't protect itself. And I said, that's the story. Tell me that and I'll go with you anywhere. Hmm? Chemistry. Mm -hmm right? Chemistry. And it was sitting right in front of her the whole time. Mm -hmm. And this is what I find. And, and there hasn't been a person who I've worked with who, when we go through this exercise, they don't find something in who they are that makes them more believable. So why would you not use it? Right? So yeah, that, that's what the process is like. Once you understand that it's there, and you grab one thing, one thing, one moment in her life, right? That completely changes how I see what she does. 
and I and it goes from a that's interesting to how can I help? It does. It's it's a profound shift, isn't it? I mean, and and thank you so much, Carlos, for sharing that story because I think that that moment, as soon as you mentioned Jacques Cousteau, I was like, oh. I remember that. There's there's a real kind of is it the law of reciprocity that kind of connection where somebody gives something and you give back and you can't even you don't choose you have to connect. Yeah. There's something really emotional here, isn't there? I don't think it's that law. I know that law, but it's not that. What, what I now I'm going to back to what we talked about before the show, which was what is this about, right? And mm. what I what I tell people is persuasion is is something deeper than this. It's not about getting the deal done or about getting something sold. To me, it goes like this. Let's just say that I, yeah, that I love Jack Cousteau for whatever reason. I used to watch the show when I was a kid. I loved it. It inspired me. And uh, I just think it's the greatest thing ever. So we're at an airport. <laughs> Our flight is delayed. And we get to talking. And guess what? At some point, you say, there was this show I used to love. It's called Jack Cousteau. What happens at that moment? you and I are connected. You and I are a community of two. You and I are bonded. And this is what persuasion is, because we have an, an human need that others believe what we believe, that others love what we love, right? That others honor what we honor. And that's what it's about. We're, we want to persuade because we want to be united to other people in a truth which can be as simple as Jack Cousteau was a great person or a great show, or we should vote for this person or take the country in this direction or change this part of our society, right? So something monumental to something small and intimate, right? We want to share. And that and persuasion allows us to share, right? What we love and what we believe with other people. I think mm -hmm. that's... So is it, it feels like the word vulnerability needs to come into play here. I'm interested in your take on this because the way you're describing this is that if, if I'm using the mm -hmm. chemistry here and I'm, I'm starting to give give out, if, if I take the story there of you know, the argument but without the character, without the emotion, then I'm kind of you know, sailing with one uh, sail up. And I love that. That really kind of is just so clear to me. It's almost like I have to open up. There is no choice here. I have to open up. I have to exhibit some form of vulnerability about the real me to be able to be persuasive or to persuade because if i don't i, I am literally running at a, a very slow pace rather than sprinting here through this conversation so so is vulnerability just as a single word is that something people need to really grasp because i i just find that in a sales situation or in a, a board meeting c-suite executives getting vulnerable question mark i mean that is not the way that senior execs or business owners or people in a sales meeting or a sales presentation have been trained to do this stuff. Right. That's going to be awkward, isn't it? I'd say it's that. And the other side of that coin is trust, right? So I often talk in, in, the, in the emotion part about the difference between sentimentality and emotion, which is very important. Uh, and so sentiment is fake emotion. It's unearned. We, we, it upsets us because we feel like someone's trying to manipulate us. Emotion is a feeling that's earned. And I, and I write in the book, and I use often the example of Schindler's List versus Saving Private Ryan. The endings of both movies are very similar. Uh, both movies are about World War II. Both movies are about a man. Both movies uh, end in a transition from the past where the movie has taken place to the present. Both movies end in a cemetery with people addressing a dead person, right? So all these similarities, same director, uh, same cinematographer, same composer. I think uh, only the screenwriter is different. One is emotional, one is sentimental. One was praise, one was panned. Right? And my theory is that in, in Shinless List, Spielberg trusts the audience. In Private Ryan, he doesn't. Consciously or subconsciously, they didn't trust us to get it. And so they overdid it, right? So 
it's vulnerable, but then it's also trust. What are you going to do when you know what I know, what you now know? And if I trust you, I'll tell you. I'll tell you the story about Jack Cousteau or some other thing. And I think that's the key thing, that you're right. It's not that they're just not vulnerable. It's that they don't trust. Right? Mm -hmm. They're not vulnerable, not because they couldn't be, but they don't trust the audience. Does that require self kind of confidence because I could imagine somebody early into the game here would be thinking that's all very well for you to say Carlos but I'm not even confident in self let alone actually being in front of somebody or an audience to do this stuff I don't even actually either understand myself or have that level of I don't know self gravitas or confidence whatever you want to call it that's going to be a challenge for a lot of people isn't it I think it's just a matter of how powerful do you want to be right? Because again, this is chemistry. <clears throat> and it goes back to the other question I wanted to answer with the book, which was, what is persuasion, right? And the, there's a, a kind of four-step process that I outline in the book. And I say, it goes like this, state zero is sort of what, what, kind of pre-audience state, right? especially in marketing terms. The, the person hasn't received the message yet. Then you send the person a message. A lot of things have to work which we take for granted in that moment. It must be in a language I understand. The visual rhetoric must be clear to me. Uh, I must be willing to accept the message, right? It must be about a topic that I have at least some interest in. So all these boxes are checked. I acknowledge receipt of a message. Let's say it's an ad that, I, that says I should go on vacation in Barcelona. And then I start to read the ad. What's happening? A great communicator has created a formulation which releases energy as I engage with it. But that's never enough. The audience must also contribute something. So I contribute, I give energy, the message gives energy, the communicator gives energy. The, at some point, if enough energy is released, what happens? The truth is made vivid, which means it becomes visible in your mind. That is the moment of persuasion. When it comes to life, when you can see it, you see yourself walking in Barcelona on vacation. <laughs> you have not been persuaded. Now, the only thing left is adherence, which is how long will it stay? You may forget the next day you were persuaded for a day, or you, you may be persuaded for the rest of your life about something, right? I've seen both examples. So the interesting thing is that at that moment of persuasion, what happens sometimes also is back to the trust issue is that sometimes an audience is like a battery. It has energy, right? It, it becomes a cell. It's been storing energy. And then along comes the communicator. And for whatever reason, their chemistry unlocks the cell. And as you know, current, current always wants to move, right? So energy wants to travel. When the, when the communicator comes, the energy will rush into that message, into that person. And sometimes you see a communicator who is stunned. They can't believe the, the results. And it's that you didn't know there was a cell waiting to discharge, right? And I think that happened in Brexit, for example. I think it's what happened with Donald Trump and his campaign. He had the chemistry that no one else had, and suddenly in came just the way Obama had done eight years earlier when he tapped into a cell that had been charging during eight years of George Bush. Right? The energy that was stored during the Bush era is what put Obama in the White House. The energy that had been stored during eight years of Obama is what put Trump in the White House, right? And it's a remarkable thing that sometimes you have this phenomenon. So I believe that what you have to understand is that if you really wanna persuade at the highest level, especially with things that are very, very important, you must be able to release the energy from the audience, right? And use it, use it to bring a truth to life. If you do that, then you've got immense power, right? And, and, and I mean, in the full, in the power to change an entire, to change history, right? And we see that time and time again. So, yeah. So when, when you say having a, a sense of, what I want you to feel afterwards. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm trying to persuade you 
for something. Yeah. Do I have to kind of almost let you know prior to the communication or at the very outset of the communication how I want you to feel, either consciously or subconsciously, for you to then almost reverse engineer back when I start telling my story to then, oh, yeah, well, now we've arrived at that point. Or can I keep that under wraps as the persuader? Because it feels to me that there's some some real fundamental, quite profound learning that marketers mm -hmm. you know, potentially here can really learn in terms of their marketing strategies and communication strategies or salespeople in that sales meeting. Is it, is it a requirement that we help somebody to understand, this is how I want you to feel at the end of this? Right, now here's my story. Here's my pitch to you. Or can I keep that end result under wraps and kind of build and build and build so that that becomes almost like a crescendo finale at the end of it? Is there a right or wrong way with that? No, it works both ways. And, and a good example of this is you, you'll notice how many TV shows or movies today open with the ending, right? This has become a thing in the last few decades, which was in classical sort of filmmaking in the 70s. You would never do that. You would never start with the last shot at the beginning. Like Jaws does not open with Brody killing the shark. Today, you wouldn't be surprised to see that the last shot is him killing, blowing up the shark, and then all of a sudden we're back to the beginning. Right? This is a very common filmmaking or storytelling technique today. In that case, you get this emotional jolt at the start of the film, and then the director builds back up to it later, right? So this is a relatively modern kind of thing um, in some ways. And so uh, traditionally you would put it at the end and you build to the end and you or you engineer it to your point, right? And it is that, in fact, Aristotle says in his, in his book, to use an emotion, you must know three things about it. A, what creates it? B, how does it behave, right? And C, what is its effect? And I'll give you an example. Anger accelerates the mind for the most part. So if you want someone to not pay attention closely to argument, you make them angry. <laughs> right? Because as the mind speeds, the fact that your numbers don't add up, let's go back to Brexit, that the, the data isn't quite locking in, doesn't matter. I'll make you angry. And you'll think you got it, but you really didn't. Right? Uh, if I want to slow you down, I'll use nostalgia, right? Contemplation, right? Memory, right? remembrance. These, these emotions slow us down, right? And so sorrow. So the, the chemist knows exactly even at what speed I want you to operate. And, and this is something that like, filmmakers know really well, because this is part of filmmaking, right? When the ones who are very good, they accelerate, they slow down, these kinds of things. So, uh, but a great communicator can do the same thing with language, because because the filmmaking is the kind of language, right? It's a complex one, but uh, it's still language. And so, yeah, you're exactly right. And so when I talk to people, I go, well, "What do you want me to feel? Do you want me to feel excited? Do you want uh, inspired? By the way, what is inspiration?" They don't really know. And I go, inspiration is the creation of desire. Inspiration is to convince you that you lack something, right? That's it. So when a CEO tries to inspire, what they're convincing you is you don't have something. Perfection, you know, these perfection speeches, what is that really saying? You're not perfect, but you need to be, right? <laughs> and even in, you know, in romantic settings, right? The, the person is walking down the street, their life is fine. They meet the special person. Suddenly, I'm quote unquote incomplete, right? Even the famous Jerry Maguire scene, "You complete me," right? Tom Cruise says at the end, "Well, I was fine yesterday, but now I have this hole that's that's only going to be filled by you, right? Perfection, innovation, inspiration is the creation of desire, right? So you want to inspire? What what desire? What have you? What are you persuading me that I lack? Because if you don't do that, you're not inspiring me." Right. So, and it's remarkable how, again, how otherwise phenomenally accomplished people will give presentation after presentation, talk after talk, meeting after meeting, and they've never think about something as basic as what do you want me to feel? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so if I've, if I've done this for, for, for many, many years, and it feels like this is a, 
a life journey. It doesn't feel like even as an accomplished communicator persuaded that you're really ever going to master this with a uh, an uppercase M. This is something that you just continually build day by day, moment by moment. So it feels like it's, this is the long haul. This is not a, a quick fix. So, But let's just say I get to a point having dedicated a lot of my energy, a lot of my time, a lot of you know emotional sort of feeling behind this, a lot of thought, a lot of care and attention. So I've really, really paid, paid into this one. If I start getting quite good at this, and let's say I start getting really good at this. Mm -hmm. Is there a danger it becomes a little too much, a little kind of too useful, a little, I don't want to get back onto the whole kind of manipulation thing, but does it become potentially a little bit too powerful for a human to handle? I think it can be. And there's an interesting book that I talk about in my book called Psychoanalytic Listening. And it's, and it's a handbook for psychiatrists for how to listen to patients. Because listening is very important. Right? One of the things that great communicators do is they're great listeners. And in this book, uh, Dr. Salman Akhtar explains to therapists eight different techniques of listening, right? And so, and he explains why each one is different, uh, which one works in the context of therapy. And he says at the end in the epilogue, by the way, be careful. Don't start doing this with your family. <laughs> Right. You're just going to tick them off, basically. So this is for professional use only in that sense. So I, I think this has a little bit of that where you need to know that this is a skill. Right. And it's a funny thing because you I think you might have mentioned the, the art of rhetoric, maybe. And I say in the book that this isn't really the title, because what happened is that it became a tradition to translate the title of, of Aristotle's work as the art of rhetoric. It's not. There's a word in Greek called techne, where we get technique from. And techne is not art. Art in Greek would have been something different. It had an aesthetic connotation that, te that persuasion doesn't. Techne is a practical art or art with purpose. It's closer to gym, like uh, to physical training or like carpentry, right? And so um, it, it, it should be the, the techne of rhetoric. And so it is a technical thing. And just the way you leave technical things at work when you get home, right? You're not, you're not flow charting your kids right? <laughs> or building spreadsheets about, <laughs> maybe you are, I don't know, like I, I don't, right? Uh, so leave this professional skill for the professional setting, but it does make you a much better critic, right? Back again to what I said earlier, which is I can't, at this point, I can't help but hear everything, see everything, because this is what I do for a living. I study language, right? And and to go, hmm, that's an interesting formulation or that's interesting delivery method. Like for example, narrative, you hear the story about storytelling. Well, back to my chemistry thing, storytelling is a delivery device. You know how I can give you medicine in liquid or a gel cap or a pill or a shot. Well, narrative is, is like the liquid that's been sweetened, right? We, we, it's easy for us to take. <laughs> and so getting good at narrative is because all to me, narrative is change over time. If you take any story, it's what changes over what period of time. So change over time, you learn how to be a good narrator, you could be a good storyteller, it just means that you're very good at taking your formulation and put it into liquid form, in a little cup that I can swallow. If you're going to give me 15 slides of statistics, that's like a shot. <laughs> <laughs> right or extended chemotherapy <laughs> maybe even better but five days of chemotherapy it's like being in some presentations where you just go all right i'm lost and it's an interesting thing i have this rule of five i think it's a five to one rule which is if you love argument the more you love argument the more you love statistics facts powerpoints these kind of things the more you are persuaded by it the farther you are from persuading the average person argument is hard it's hard to follow and it's hard to create. We have whole schools to teach people how to argue correctly. They're called law schools. They're called PhD programs in philosophy, medical schools, right? These are hardcore settings where you spend years, decades to, to learn how to build specialized arguments for specialized audiences. For the average person who hasn't had that training, 
they will, their logic and their argument elements formulations often fall apart within a minute or two. And maybe you've been in that kind of meeting where someone thinks they built a coherent formulation of argument. And after a minute you go, I, I'm lost. What are you, what are you trying to say? Right. And so because it's hard to build and because it's hard to follow, then you, then oftentimes I tell people, let's just take the same information. Let's change the delivery mechanism. Let's, let's take it out of the series of injections and let's put it into a cup there. Right. And how do you do that? Well, take, and I'll give you an example for one. Let's say you're in a project or, you, or I, I was a, a, a product launch. I was involved with a cosmetics company. And this cosmetics company was int interesting because they never analyzed when something failed. They just didn't, right? Perfume brand goes out, catastrophe, never make the book as they used to call it. Well, why not? I don't know. So you start to look at it and you, you could do it one of two ways. I could I could give you a very, very long 30 page white paper about why this launch failed, right? Or I can tell you a story about how the brand operations never got together on what this thing was supposed to be. So the packaging was wrong, timing was wrong, they, they didn't the market analysis wasn't that great, but I tell you through the words of the people who were in it. Same information, one is delivered through narrative of the agents involved in the failed launch. One is an analysis and analytical, all right? Now, one works for one setting, maybe for the CFO, right? For the for the next product launch team, maybe not so much. Maybe the narrative has more is more persuasive. So that's the other thing is good communicators know when to deliver the medicine, <laughs> right? As, as a couple of pills, as a shot, or as here's a little, cup for you to drink and it's the effect once it's in the body the effect is the same right you know once the chemistry is in there it's going to do whatever it's going to do mm. Mm. Yeah. carlos i want to get this book into people's hands it's important that we share this how can people get hold of a copy well it's available on amazon as usual uh in many formats uh, one of the funny things that happened was the the way the book work, work, world works is that when you publish a book it's shown to audiobook people for optioning and they can choose to option it or pass on it. So, so audiobooks.com optioned the book. And then they called me and said, would you like to audition to, to narrate your own book? <clears throat> they want to hear an audition tape. So without thinking about it, I said yes. And I recorded an audition tape. And then I got the kick, which turned out to be a nightmare. <laughs> I had to sit <laughs> in a, in a recording studio in, in DC for five afternoons. And at the end of the week, we started on a Monday, we finished on a Friday, I think. And I, I was, I couldn't talk, I lost my voice. It, you, you, in a booth, you have to be perfectly still because the microphones pick up the slightest noise from your stomach, if it's rumbling or if you should move your hands. So yeah, so if you, if you listen to books, listen to this book only because I worked so hard. I think I worked harder to record it than I did to write it. So writing is easy for me, talking is not. So yeah, you can get it on Kindle, it's an audiobooks, it's an audible, there's a digital version, there's the, the I think it's in 20 or 30 countries. So it certainly is in the UK. And um, and it's I, I chose to make it as easy to get as possible. And if you wanna know more about other things I've written or things that are, because I have, that novel that I set out to write will be out later this year. So um, you can go to carlosalvarenga.com and you can also send me a note. I always appreciate hearing from people, especially after you've read the book. You can just type a note to me on, yeah, carlosalvarenga.com if you want to know more. And can you tell what Carlos just did there, everybody? He gave you a little bit of an emotional story there. There was a little bit of storytelling as part of the persuasion. He didn't just give you where you can download it. This is a master at work, everybody. Carlos, thank you so much for your time and uh, a devotion to this topic, which I think you've opened a, literally a whole new book and a series of chapters for everyone here, including me. And I'm really looking forward to uh, reading this book from cover to cover, because I think for all of us, personally and professionally, obviously significantly professionally, there is so much to learn from this. So Carlos, thank you again. No, it's a pleasure. Uh, grateful to you for having me on. Grateful to your audience for listening to me. Uh, thank you and uh, wish everybody a great day. Bye-bye.